Released in February of this year, Firewatch tells the story of Henry, a schlubby guy in his early 40s who has taken up a post as a fire lookout after his wife has taken ill with early onset Alzheimer's. Once at his post, he meets another fire lookout over the radio, Delilah, whose own lookout tower is only a few miles away. Over the summer, they begin to get close, despite the physical distance between them, until they find a notepad containing transcripts of their intimate conversations. From there, the game turns into something of a paranoia-laced thriller as the two try to figure out who is listening and why. Am I just making all of this up? I mean, the eavesdropping, the spying, is this... Fuck, are you... Are you is any of this real? What? Are you serious? Maybe I'm, I'm just... Maybe I'm just losing my mind. What? Like Julia. Maybe it's happening to me, and, and I'm imagining that I have a boss out here and that we're being spied on. Henry. Maybe there was something in the water, or our condo was underneath some power lines, and, and you, Delilah, you're not real. Henry, Henry, think about her. If what happened to her were happening to you, you wouldn't even be able to realize it. The Campo Santo decided to make Firewatch's protagonist a 40-something-year-old with a 40-something-year-old's problems is one of the more remarkable things about the game. There aren't a lot of games about getting older or about what it means to be middle-aged, or at least approaching middle age. Part of that is a demographics thing. Games are a pretty young medium, with young developers telling stories to often even younger players. Part of it is that it's hard to tell nuanced stories about the subtle losses that come with aging in any medium, let alone in games which struggle so mightily to be about anything other than the physical. And part of it is just trying to figure out how to make games about a non-flashy and kind of depressing subject matter commercially viable. It's just a hard subject for games to tackle. So the fact that Firewatch manages to achieve what it does with those ideas is pretty amazing. But you wouldn't know it to look at a lot of the responses to the game. This is anecdotal on my part, admittedly, but among a lot of my non-critic friends, the general reaction to Firewatch is that it was really good until the ending, and, and then it wasn't. The reason for this, I think, is that the game sets itself up a series of Chekhov's guns and then refuses to fire them. And by most measures, that's bad storytelling. Just about every story the game implies it's telling you kind of just fizzles out instead. The girls in the woods that go missing and that Henry was the last one to see alive? They're arrested for stealing some farmer's tractor later on. It's nothing to worry about, nothing to see here, they're fine. Nothing wagered, nothing lost. That top secret research facility that was tracking Henry's movements and logging his conversations? It really was just a local botanist setting up a soil experiment. The whirlwind long distance romance between Delilah and Henry? She leaves the forest during the fire and despite finally arriving at her tower, Henry never even sees her. There's a point about halfway through the game where you're juggling worries about being wanted by the police for two dead girls, this secret military base that seems to be spying on you, an interloper on the radio, and a blossoming summer love affair, and the resolution to pretty much all of them is, and then the problem went away and nothing happened. And it's easy to see how that unsatisfying ending leaves a sour taste in a lot of people's mouths, even if they loved all the stuff that came before. I mean, imagine if halfway through Fellowship of the Ring, Gandalf was suddenly like, Oh, you know what? This isn't the one ring at all. That's a completely different ring. My bad. But all of that disappointment is kind of the point of the game. At some level, Firewatch as a critique of escapism is a coping mechanism. Henry runs into the mountains to avoid confronting the reality of his wife's condition and some of the ways he may have screwed up in responding to that situation. He doesn't go out there to move on. She isn't dead, and he's still married to her. He doesn't go out there to find himself, either. He's a 40-year-old dude that pretty much knows what he's about. He goes out there to run away from reality for a little bit, to hide for a few months in a place he doesn't feel as guilty and isn't reminded of his wife's absence every day. And the whole game is about how that decision to run away, and every decision afterwards that pushes him further and further from confronting his reality, is the wrong one. This is perhaps made most clear with Ned, who is set up to be something of a dark analog to Henry. Like Henry, Ned suffered family trauma when his son died in the park. And like Henry, Ned rejected reality and retreated further into the park to avoid coming face to face with the consequences of what had happened. Not just his son's death, but the reality that he's kind of responsible for his son's death. And in the process of hiding from that reality, he became something of a dangerous loner, listening in on other people's conversations, hiding in a cave, and threatening people, not to mention, you know, burning down forests. He's the closest thing the game has to an antagonist, and he got there by taking Henry's refusal to face reality to its logical extreme. 
Henry can even end up defending Ned to Delilah in phrasing that could easily be mistaken for his own situation. I think, I think that Ned loved him. He still had his photo, you know? I want to hear it. He, he obviously didn't want to forget him. He just didn't know what to do. Henry, not knowing what to do isn't okay. When you're supposed to look after someone, you... You figure it out. Yes. And Ned Goodwin is a shithead who is incapable of figuring anything out. Sorry. Henry was supposed to look after Julia, but failed. Like Ned, he also hasn't figured things out. And like Ned, he doesn't want to forget. And so, like Ned, he hides in the mountains. So what does running away from reality have to do with all those bad non-endings? Well, the game's about how we deal with them. Bad endings, I mean. That's part of why the game had to be about a 40-year-old guy and not a kid or a young lover. At 20 or maybe even 30, you may have broken someone's heart, but you haven't committed yourself to someone for years and made decisions that impact their life and reverberate through decades. That someone could be a partner or a child or someone else entirely, but by middle age, you've been able to watch your mistakes with them unfold with time. Not even mistakes, necessarily, but decisions. Less, I cheated on you with someone else, and more, you wanted to move to the other side of the country, and I didn't want to, so I asked you to give up your career for me. Or, you really wanted kids, but I kinda didn't, so we kept putting off the conversation entirely, and now maybe it's too late. Or even, they say I shouldn't take my kid out on this job, but I'm sure it'll be fine, and he needs to see the great outdoors anyway. The sort of shitty, small compromises you make every day, and the bigger choices that you carry with you for years that, whether you want them to or not, come to define who you are. The boring but important stuff that makes you a good or bad partner, a good or bad parent, a good or bad son or daughter. Ned Goodwin watched his son die because he was irresponsible and pushed him to do something he really didn't want to do, and his guilt consumed him. Henry has done some crappy things to Julia, and now that their marriage has fundamentally changed, he doesn't want to own up to them. Like Ned, he doesn't want to face his loss, but he also doesn't want to face what his loss says about him. Getting older means watching people you care about deeply begin to slip away one way or another, and often enough it's not in clean, happy ways. Sometimes it's by death, sometimes it's by Alzheimer's, sometimes it's just parting on kinda crappy terms. And when people leave us, they do so in the way that Firewatch ends its stories. Not with a smashing, satisfying climax, but mundanely, quietly, and often tragically. The question is, when things don't end the way you want them to, what are you going to do? When you can't make it right anymore, when you realize the pushed off decisions and bad choices can't be fixed, how do you control your guilt? This is why the fires are a recurring metaphor, which is hinted at by the containment language Delilah uses at the end of the game. Ah, bad things happen, okay? And you have to... you have to find a way to contain the damage. A good way. Well, hopefully I can figure out a way to do that. Yeah, I hope so. God, this got dark. Oh shit. Firewatch is about people who go out into the woods looking for damage that needs containing in an effort to avoid containing their own damage. How's that for irony? Really, though, Firewatch is about how we live, how we cope, with unhappy endings. Anyways, I get that people don't like the ending of the game because it violates storytelling convention and pulls the rug out from anyone that thought it really was about to become a conspiracy thriller. At first blush, the game's story is basically a three-hour version of One time, I was in a forest, and I thought I was in trouble, but then I wasn't. It's only when those unfired Chekhov's guns are viewed in the greater context of the game's themes that they begin to make sense, that the disillusionment with the fantasy and the collapse of those narratives is intentional and not just poor storytelling. And really, storytelling is one of the most interesting things about Firewatch. To tell Henry's tale, it borrows ideas from so many different places that all once felt experimental, and here makes them feel quite natural. For example, Firewatch mirrors the lonely nature walks of Dear Esther and Proteus. The quiet interludes between dialogues let you focus on what has been said, and both Dear Esther and Firewatch use the technique to emphasize the desolation both of their protagonists feel about their broken relationships. Meanwhile, Proteus and Firewatch both have a keen interest in selling nature as a place that's awe-inspiring and yet isolating. 
The opening of the game pulls from Twine and other hypertexts, providing its exposition and your entire relationship with Julia via a short interactive story bit. It's a wonderful trick because it encourages you to envision Julia and Henry's marriage as something you have a bit of ownership in. It's not just exposition that gets dumped onto you, it's exposition you help build. You decide how Henry first introduces himself to Julia. You decide what they named their dog. You decide how he deals with Julia's job offer. It gives you a stake in their relationship, and it does so with minimal cost to the developer and minimal time on the part of the player. It's over before the title drops. It's effective enough that I wonder why more RPGs with set characters don't do something like it, and I would expect to see more of this in the future. Firewatch also takes notes from Gone Home's environmental storytelling, using baubles and personal effects to sell a character's mood or non-verbally provide exposition that goes as deep as the player wishes to probe. But it's also in this confluence of approaches that I think there might be some unexpected tension in the way the game is framed. Not necessarily in a way that hurts the work overall, but one that flips the player's mindset back and forth when playing in a way that's jarring. First, Firewatch leans heavily on environmental storytelling. It's used in a lot of the post-intro exposition delivery, whether it's Ned's secret hideout, or the Wapiti research facility, or even just Henry's lookout post, the game wants to use objects scattered around the environment to establish what either the player or Henry didn't experience directly. That is, Henry and the player can infer Ned's story from his home, while the player can infer a lot of what's going on with Henry by poking around his lookout tower as the game progresses. Firewatch asks players to walk around and absorb as many details as they can because that's how the game is communicating itself to you. A lot of the story isn't told so much as it is inferred from environmental cues. The game's environment is also important in a more literal way. Firewatch wants to sell you on the whole forest thing. It offers some carrots for exploration, like maps and a side story told through notes and an optional pet turtle, but more than active exploration, the forest map is used to sell the physicality of the space you find yourself in, the distance between destinations, the paths you have to walk, the vistas you see. These long corridors between points of interest don't have as much going on from a look at all the details and infer the story kind of approach, but are instead important by nature of being space that has to be traversed and learned. You map them in your head as Henry charts them out on paper. You calmly hike preset routes at the beginning of the game, and by the end you find yourself figuring out the fastest routes around the map. The scope and shape of the forest are used to convey a lot of things. Isolation through quiet walks alone. Intimacy by sharing a fire across several miles of space. And alien spaces you feel uncomfortable invading by placing Wapiti Meadow's secret facility as far away on the map from the player's base as possible. Between pushing environmental stories through found objects and walks through corridors that emphasize tone and distance and geography, the player is constantly getting one clear message. Time and space matter. Time and space are how the game communicates. But that relationship between player character and their environment is undercut by another storytelling approach. Jump cuts. Alright, I got everything I need out of here. Time to chow down. Just yours, right? Who do you think I am? row seat for what might be the biggest fire of the year. There's sort of an unspoken tension between these two approaches, I think. Like I said in my video on Blendo stuff, I love the idea of experimenting with real-time editing and producing a game that has a snappy pacing or juxtaposition of images to sell its meaning. But these jump cuts really aren't here to juxtapose scenes. A few seconds of loading between each prevents that from really happening. Get in your tower, shut the door, don't leave, and don't use your radio. I'll call you. Understand? I will call you. Thoroughfare Tower, this is Two Forks calling you for the, oh, 50th time today. And I can't say they're there to control pacing, exactly, because so much of the rest of the game encourages you to just get lost, or take your time exploring. Instead, they're there to sort of yada 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 over the bits of summer the game doesn't consider interesting, but in doing so they remove the sense that time and space matter, and instead put the focus squarely on the written narrative. And you can see this happening as you play the game. The wandering parts of Firewatch are all about what's happening in the forest. Go stop those girls from starting a fire. What's happening at Wapiti Station? Get back to your tower, there's someone there! But the highly edited parts of the game stick around just long enough for the conversations they deliver, and then they abruptly end. Without these radios, we could, um... You know... Well, we could just watch this 
fire. It's going to burn for a long time. You can't wander around the canyon in the deep red of the sunset the evening you find out the girls have gone missing, even though taking pictures of the natural beauty of the forest is something the game otherwise encourages you to do. You may want to go try to find the pet turtle on day two, but if you report the note left by the teenagers first, the game will proceed to cut without warning. It's just a jarring shift that seems to come from nowhere. The game goes from environmental to scripted and edited with very little warning. It makes the day indicators and the transitions dramatic, but it also makes the core design feel a bit conflicted. Is this a game about space and environment, or is it a game about the writing? Not that a game can't be about both, but this game refuses to be about both at the same time. And again, that doesn't make either part bad. I love sitting on my balcony, looking out at the June fire while talking to Delilah and focusing on their relationship just as much as I love the long, quiet hikes that put me into Henry's headspace. It just means that the game bumbly transitions between these two approaches while trying to tell Henry's story, and I'm not sure it quite works as well as it could. But even if this convergence of different storytelling techniques doesn't always gel, it's really neat to see a game combine them. It's something of a Rosetta Stone of the last few years of experiments in game storytelling. Less, maybe, graffiti on the walls as a means of exposition delivery. Wait, no, wait, it's got that too. Anyways, it doesn't break new ground, but it sells its story in ways both recent and old. Modern, unbroken first-person narratives go back to at least Half-Life, and the hypertexts that inspired Twine go back decades. The point is, Firewatch is an effective parable about aging, responsibility, and loss. And it's told with just about every trick in the book in a way that lands more often than not. 